Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This is Abdul Nasser Jengda, and you're listening to the Qalam Podcast. The Qalam Podcast has become an important part of people's lives all around the world. There are millions of people benefiting from the podcast every single day. Thousands of hours of content, dozens of different series from all the different teachers and scholars here at Qalam. All of this is delivered to the community free of charge. We are excited and actively working to grow and increase our efforts to deliver more and more benefit to the community. We ask you to support our efforts and become part of the Qalam family. Please go to qalamfamily.com and sign up to contribute to this Sadaqa Jariyah on a monthly basis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us Jazakumullahu khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We're good. Jazakumullahu khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. We ask Him to make this gathering a beneficial gathering of knowledge for us where our knowledge of Allah increases. Um, and it's specifically what our intention in this gathering is to learn how shaitan, how Satan tries to deceive us. The name of this series, and this is class number number nine. Number? Number eight, okay. Class number eight, the, the, the point of this series is to learn how Satan tries to throw us off the track. And by studying these different methodologies that have been taught to us through the hadith, we're able to be equipped, to be aware. Um, last week, we had a beautiful session. Um, you guys' energy was amazing. We talked about how shaitan always wants us to forget the blessings that we have. And so we talked last week about remembering all the blessings that you have. And you stay positive, you stay happy, and, and shaitan loves to see you sad. And so we talked about the way you fight that sadness is that you always remember the blessings that you have. We talked about that um, last week. Um, this week we're also similarly going to talk about another method shaitan uses to take away your happiness, your tra tranquility, your peace of mind. So when we look at the different tricks of shaitan, I need you to understand this. Sometimes shaitan is trying to throw off your actions. As a Muslim, we got two things, y'all. We got belief in Allah and we got actions. We have belief in Allah and we have actions. Whenever, uh, so shaitan is always attacking one of these two things. He's either attacking our belief in Allah, trying to, to make us question Allah's existence. And throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us about his signs so that we, we are protected from these, these uh, whispers from shaitan about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about the Rasul. But the other thing that shaitan tries to mess up or destroy are the actions that we do. Right? He tries to, because we believe, so he can't throw off our belief. But at least he can throw off the actions that we're doing. Example, like you're, you're doing something for the sake of Allah. If he could sprinkle a little, little riyah on that joint, you know riyah? Showing off. If he could sprinkle a little, little, a little of that, the action is done. Because it's no longer sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't matter how good it is. So what you have to understand is some of the tricks are related to our beliefs and some of the tricks are related to our action. What's crazy about what we're going to talk about today is that this trick actually attacks both of these things. This particular trick of shaitan attacks both our belief and it attacks our actions. And it's all going to come from one hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today today's a heavy one. This is a heavy one. This this as I was studying and preparing for this, this had major implications on the way I carry myself and I hope it has the same for you. I want to start with a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This one hadith of the Prophet is a very powerful hadith. And at the end of the hadith speaks about this effect that shaitan can have on us. Listen to this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al-mu'min qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ilallah min mu'min da'if. 
Man, I've been waiting for this hadith for like months, y'all. The strong believer is more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. Been waiting for this for a minute, Haytham. Like, I needed the justification for the gym, for the run club, for all of that stuff. So listen to this. The hadith tells us that to be strong, to be a strong believer. Now, some scholars say, wait, the prophet is talking about strength of iman. Some scholars say, no, the strength to hold down your, your nafs, your desires, that's strength. The strength to, to pick up your blanket at fudger time. Some of y'all bench a lot of uh, pounds, but you can't even move that blanket for fudger time. What's the deal? Where's the strength at then? So the idea is some say that this is related to spiritual strength. But without a shadow of a doubt, the Prophet Sallallahu prays physical strength as well. The, the Prophet Sallallahu definitely prays. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he says, وَفِي كُلٍ خَيْرٍ Both the weak believer and the, and the strong believer, believer, because they have faith in Allah, there's good in both of them. But the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that we need to strive to be strong people. We need to strive to be a strong ummah. Being weak is not just, you know how sometimes you get to a certain age and you just be like, oh yeah, I'm getting old now. No, uh uh-uh. Yo, strive to be strong. Strive to be a strong believer. And if you have any other intention, it's because of this hadith right here. I'm going to give you a proof because, you know, you're like, oh, this is just from Sheikh. No, when we were, when the believers, when the Muslims were coming back to Mecca in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we were going back to Mecca. It was during the treaty time. And the kuffar of Mecca, they hated the Muslims. We were their enemy. And they had spread rumors that the Muslims had become weak in Yathrib, in Medina. That we were weak. So the Prophet ﷺ found out and heard, hey, they're calling us weak. They said that Medina, the air in Medina, made us weak. So the Prophet ﷺ, he started something that we do till today. What is that? When you go for Umrah... All the brothers finally, Asad, my man, everybody else. Finally, what happens? The believer does what? When we went for tawaf, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Brothers, I want you to do something. I want you to take your right shoulder out and, and put the ihram around your shoulder. So when we do tawaf, you can show this arm. And, and it's only this arm because it's what they would see. If you don't need another proof, that's the strongest proof right there. The Prophet wanted to show strength. And so... Uh, I think as believers, we need to understand the importance of building our physical, emotional, all of these strengths. But physical strength is, a, is, is something the Prophet looked up to. It is something the Prophet Sallallahu looked up to. So the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith, he says, Al-Mu'min Qawi, the strong believer, khair wa ahabbu ilallah, is better and more beloved to Allah than the weaker believer. But both of them are good. I want to share something, yo. This applies to women and men, by the way. Just to be very clear, I got to get to the actual trick of shaitan, but you got to hear this. During the battle of Khandak, the Muslims had went to the front line to fight. And many of the women and children, they were back in one of the fortresses just to be safe. And the neighboring tribe of Yehud, Jews, had rebelled against us. So real quick, I'll be really quick with this one. So it so happened that there was someone trying to climb into the fortress to attack our women and children. And so Safiya, the aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu she says to Hassan bin Thabit, who here knows who Hassan bin Thabit is? He's the poet of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet literally set up a member. Can you imagine a masjid nowadays with a member for spoken word? It was, it was how we defended ourselves with lyrics. Another topic for another day. So, the, so Hassan bin Thabit was actually in the fortress. This is crazy. So Safiya says to Hassan bin Thabit, Oh Hassan, go out and, and, and take care of that problem outside. He's about to attack us. Guys, just so we're in the right mode, this is war time. So like bad stuff happens, war, like fighting, killing. Like, okay, cool. All right. Because you're like, oh, why are we fighting? What's wrong? What's going on? No, it was war. Okay, just to clarify, so we're all on the same page. So Safiya says to Hassan bin Thabit, can you leave and go and take care of this man? And Hassan bin Thabit, he goes, ma'am, if I was strong enough to take care of him, I'd be on the front line with the rest of the believers. Hassan bin Thabit 
had seen something really traumatic early in his life and he couldn't fight. And the prophet recognized that and he allowed him to stay back. That goes to show, the mu'min qawi, he wasn't strong enough to fight, but there was nobody that could handle his lyrics. There was nobody that could handle his poetry. And his poetry was his greatest defense of the prophet. So what I'm trying to say to you, to everyone in this room, develop your strength, build your strength, help yourself and help this deen by becoming the strongest believer that you can become. Hassan bin Thabit couldn't swing a sword, but he could sp- swing a pin like none other. So you got to discover where your strength is, and you got to use that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the mu'min, strong mu'min and the, weak, uh, the, weak, the strong believer is more beloved and, 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 and loved by God than the weak believer, but both of them have good in them. Then the Prophet said, Ihris ala ma Have a desire for what benefits you. Have a desire, have a, have a burning desire to have something that benefits you. And this is an important part of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to come back to this. But the Prophet ﷺ said, everyone in this room should have this deep burning desire inside of you to get things that benefit you. Whatever it may be, wherever it is, you want it, you go after it, you're a go-getter. The Prophet ﷺ's word, Ihris ala man yanfa'uka. Seek after, go after the things that are beneficial for you. It's not just going to come to you. If you want good things, you got to go get it. And that's what the prophet is saying here. All right, where's the trick of shaitan, Mikael? Hold up, it's coming, I promise you. Wasta'in billah and ask Allah to help you on all your affairs. Wala ta'jaz. And don't be incapable. We're going to talk about this in a lot more detail. Don't have inability, don't be unable. Be capable, be a capable person. You may be like, wait, what does that mean? I got you, just hold it for a second. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, so what did you do? You built your strength. You were eager for anything that could benefit you. You asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. And then after that, you tried hard. You never quit. And then what happens? The Prophet says this. Here's the trick of shaitan. وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ shay'un. If something, after all of those things you just did, if something happens, فَلَا تَقُلْ Never ever say, man, if I had did this, this would have happened, this would have happened. If I had did this, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. Right here, this, this is a mind-changing paradigm for me. The deen of Islam says, when something happens, after you tried your best, you built your strength, you asked Allah for help, you'd never quit. And, it, and then something goes wrong, never ever say these words. What if I had did this instead? Never ever say those words. Why? Look what the Prophet ﷺ says. He says, Walakin. You know what you should say? Say, Qadrullah Masha'a. Whatever Allah wills is what happens. Here's the part. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, because by you saying, I shoulda, if I had, the Prophet said that this word, this phrase, opens up the door of shaitan. This is a powerful concept, y'all. Look, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, you've heard his name before. I've spoken about him in, in Halaqat. Ibn, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that whenever you tried your best, you sought help, you, you did from Allah, you, you didn't quit, and things don't go your way. At that point, when you start to say, lo, if, what you're doing is you're running away from reality. You're running away from what's in front of you right now. And here's the attack. Remember I told you some of the tricks of shaitan come after your faith and some of them come after your action? This one right here, when you start saying, man, I should have married such and such. Man, I should have went to such and such school. Man, I should have did this. I should have did this. At that point, what happens? And this is where it gets deep. Ibn Qayyim al Jawzi, he says, when a situation comes to you that you don't like, what you should have done is you should have faced that situation head on. You know, like you're driving down the street, you get a flat tire. 
All of us, we done watched all these uh, motion pictures with the multiverse, and if, if you had went back in time and did a different thing. So everybody's mind starts going down. Like, if I had turned, all right, if I went 365 instead of, you know, George Washington, whatever, President Bush, <laughs> like, I wonder what my reality would have been then. No, 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 stop. Opens the door of Shaitan. Here's why. Here's what, he says that the tire goes flat on President George Bush, whatever. Turnpike, yeah, man, I got you. <laughs> Every week, the youngins in the front coming at me. Every week, the youngins in the front coming at me. Mashallah, I love them, though. I love them. They keep me in check. I look there, I'm like, all right, watch what I say. <laughs> no, so listen, you get the flat tire. What Shaitan does at that moment is hit you with the what ifs. Man, see, I shouldn't even came to the halakha. See, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even. Now, here's the deal. Ibn Qayyim al Josi, we're going to talk about the effect of that in a minute. But Ibn Qayyim al Josi says, What should you have done? Get out the car and change the tire, man. Stop living in this alternate reality of what ifs. Stop living in this alternate reality of what ifs. He says, Bel fi hal. What you should have did in this situation, and you stuck bila. Face the situation. Face the situation. Face the situation. The thing that you need to do to push the current situation away, face it at that point. And he says this, Do not sit there and daydream about what can't ever happen. You can't go back in time. You can watch as many Marvel flicks as you want. You can't go back in time. You have to deal with what's right there in front of you. He says, this is where it gets deep. He says, when you start to go down the what if trail, he says, It's complete inability. Now, this was pretty hard for me to, to like conceptualize, and I, and I hope I do a good job of you understanding it. I want to talk about this word in Arabic called ajiz. Okay, if you've never heard the word, don't worry, I'm going to try my best to explain it. Um, ajiz in Arabic, ain, jim, ze, it means to be unable, not able to do something. Like, I don't have the capacity, I don't have the ability to do something. And our religion is very interesting about this concept of inability. And now as a parent, I understand it. Because sometimes, you know, like when you were young, Haytham, and, 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 and your mom told you to do something, and sometimes you're like, I don't know how. Well, my mom, she'd be like, there it is. Some of y'all, y'all got, yeah, I heard immigrants is just like black people, so. <laughs> That's what I heard, a little overlap. My mom would be like, figure it out. Figure, I don't know how ain't an excuse. I don't know how to do, fill out a resume, that ain't an excuse, figure it out. So the concept of ajiz means inability. Now I wanna share a hadith for you, now this is a heavy one. Y'all ready? One time, Auf bin Madik says, I'm trying to break down this word ajiz so you can understand what shaitan does to us. He makes us, because, hold up, before I go forward. When you start down the what if, you're not acting. You're sitting there in the daydream world, that alternate reality of the other you that got married to the other guy that proposed to you the first time. And now the kids that you have that don't have, you know, black hair, they have brown and, or blonde hair. And now for like the last 10 minutes, you're in some alternate right reality and not living life. So, so this, it stops you from action. It makes you ajiz. You're not doing anything. And Islam is about action. Allah gave you life so you can move, so you can make changes, so you can bring goodness in the world. The more you sit there and just daydream, that's not what Allah wants from you. And I'm going to go in more detail, but I want you to hear a, a narration from Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Two men came to the Prophet Sallallahu this hadith might hit y'all a little different. In the rajulain, tahakama ila nabi. Two people came to the Prophet Sallallahu over a dispute they had. One guy was saying this, the other guy was saying that. They both come to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that he could solve the issue. Faqal al maqdi alay. The Prophet Sallallahu listened to both sides, and he judged in favor of one. Abdullah, you're right. He's got the haq here. So the one who was judged against, he turned around and he began to walk away and he said, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. 
Now, for anyone who knows Muslim culture, you say that when you were wronged. Whenever you say, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil, it's like, I was done wrong to, so Allah is enough for me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't know, you can think of an example. You know what I mean? Your wife says to you, Hasbunallah. She, she's like, I don't need you. <laughs> right? Has, Allah is enough for me. What you trying to say? Oh, my man, yo, my man who just got married is in the house, mashallah. I ain't going to call you out. I ain't going to call you out. But real quick, let me tell y'all what happened. So, brother and a sister, mashallah, uh, you know, things were working out well. They got married, mashallah. He's looking around scared right now, <laughs> right? And so, mashallah, things were going well. My man disappeared from Halakha for like three weeks, yo. <laughs> mashallah, they got married. May Allah bless their marriage. Amen. See, I did all that, Habibi. I'm going to look around so nobody knows where you at. I did that, Habibi. I did that for you so you got everyone's dua right now. May Allah put barakah in their marriage. Amen. May Allah protect them from shaitan. There you go. That was what it was for. I'm looking around. Y'all know where you at right now. <laughs> okay, mashallah. Um, I just saw him, so he took my uh, attention. So, hasbunallah wa ni'mal makir. The one who the Prophet judged against, he turned around and he was walking away and he was upset. So he goes, hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. The Prophet ﷺ heard him and he was like, yo, come back. Come back. He's like, what did you say? And now the man, he's, he still says, he's like, I said, hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for me. The Prophet ﷺ said these words, Inna Allaha yalumu ala al-ajiz. Allah does not like when you're incapable. Walakin alayka bil case. You need to be capable. You need to be intelligent. Then, when you're overpowered, then you say, Hasbunallah. Basically, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Don't blame Allah when you didn't try your best. But, but the point is, the Prophet used these words, Allah doesn't like in, 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 inability. For you, I don't know. I don't know how. Figure it out, man. Learn how. Like, figure it out, man. Internet, yo, we Google everything these days. Figure out how to do it. But it's not enough. Allah doesn't like for you to just be like, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever you need to get done in life, you need to figure out how to do that. And your deen teaches you that. So the word ajiz means inability. Back to my point, when you go down the rabbit hole of what if, what if, I shoulda, I shoulda, I shoulda, what Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi says, you're sitting there thinking about things that never happen, instead of acting, you're at a place of inability. You're not doing anything. Because those what ifs aren't real. They're, they're not real. He says, no, what you need to do in that situation is be clever, be smart, because being wise is what brings goodness. But when you sit with inability, this opens the door of shaitan. This opens the door. So it's that he says, whenever you say, if this had happened, you're taking away, listen closely, you're taking away from your potential to work towards what you need. Um, and, and this what if leads you to inability. And one more thing that we're going to talk about in detail, it leads you to um, laziness. And that is definitely another trick of shaitan. So, before we go on to laziness, I want to talk about this, this low again. Another way shaitan takes away your happiness is he gets you comparing yourself to this other self of you that doesn't exist. What do I mean? It's the low you. It's the low you, the one that married that other person, went to that other school, the one that did some other stuff, went for a degree in law and not this. That What shaitan starts to do with this low he starts to make you compare yourself to this non-existent you. And because that non-existent you is better than you, the sadness over... Remember last week, what did we say? What does a method shaitan bring sadness based on last week? When he shows you, allows you to see what other people have. You just got this new, this new car. I don't even know what car to name, whatever. And you rolling up to halakha like, yeah. Listen in the Quran, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden you pull in the parking lot and the dude next to you it just gets out and his car is just quietly like, hmm. You know what I mean? Electric sound. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you kind of like, <clears throat> wow. Takes happiness away. Before you were so happy. All of a sudden, what? Happiness is starting to deplete. Why? Because you start looking to the left and the right. But this one is even more dangerous. Because now you're not even looking at somebody else who actually exists. You're looking at some fictitious you that doesn't exist. The, 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 the you that went to such and such high school and college instead of such and such high school and college. So 
This is how he removes your happiness. He starts to get you to compare yourself to this other you. What we need to understand, this is one of Shaitan's method of cognitive distortion. What does this mean? Cognitive distortion is just straight downfall. It's, it's one, of my, one of my friends, they said low leads to the, the deepest low. Like the word low leads to the deepest low. Um, because what it is, is you begin to live in alternative, alternative reality. Um, and, and you start to focus on that thing instead of living your real life. Um, here's, what I, here's what you have to do, though. I'm going to give, give us all a method of fighting this back. Um, one of the things we have to do with the waswas of shaitan, if you have a close friend, you need to articulate those thoughts. Let me explain something really deep here. Shaitan's ideas, shaitan's thoughts always make sense in your brain. But the moment you try to articulate them, they don't make sense. You talking to someone, you're like, you know what I mean? And they're like, no. <laughs> no, I don't. Run that back, yo. And you're like, yeah, well, if I had married such and such, his mother wasn't like this and da 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 da. And they're like, what? And you're like, yeah, don't you get it? Here's the deal. And this is why therapy is so good and a good friend is so powerful against Shaitan. So, because Shaitan doesn't want you to verbalize the thoughts that he's placing inside of you. The moment you get, begin to verbalize them, you realize yourself you can't even say it in an intellig intelligible way. So, so try this. I'm telling you, the next time Shaitan puts some like deep thought to you and you're like, you want to check it out, call your friend up. Be like, yo, hear, me, hear this idea I have. I want to run this past you. And if they say to you, yeah, that makes no sense whatsoever, realize where that's coming from. Realize where that's coming from. Very important aspect uh, to understand. We can't organize satanic thoughts because it doesn't make sense. And if you have a believer that you're talking to, the believer is even stronger in pointing out the fallacy of shaitan in those situations. Okay, let's go forward. Um, so this voice inside, the, the if voice, this is a voice pushing you away from reality asking you to focus on something other than reality, and this is very dangerous. Um, these cognitive distortions are heavy on us. We really get down because we think of what we think could have happened. Now, before we move forward, remember I said that this one attacks our beliefs as well? For a believer, this is the biggest issue right here. Hear me out. Whenever something happens, the believer, me and you, our default is... Allah wanted this to happen. And when you say, man, if low key, if not high key, low key, you're objecting to what Allah ordained for you. What Allah ordained for you. I'm telling you as a believer, this will save you so much trauma. I have a friend, right? My friend, he's, a, he's an estimator, right? So they put these contracts together for building properties or whatever. Major joints, big joints. He's in D.C., right? And uh, he told me this story. Uh, he's like, yo, we put this contract together, major contract. We would have each walked away with $400,000. It was like six month contract, huge multi-million dollar contract. And he's like, my partner, you know, you have to estimate, give them a budget in the city, looks at all the estimates and picks one. And the lowest one gets the bid. Y'all feel me, right? So my partner, now this dude's Muslim, partner's not Muslim. He's like, my partner was like, yo, we need to up it 30, 30 stacks, 30K. He's like, nah, bro, we're good. Like, this is really conservative. We're good. This is, mashallah. He's got all his Muslim thought going. But this guy's got his greed. He's like, no, no, no. Right? Comes to the day they open at Makaire. Tell me why they lose the bid for $250. Do you know what my man did when he lost it? He said, alhamdulillah. The other dude lost it. <laughs> lost it. Couldn't handle it. Because it's like, what if we had, what if we had, what, that what if right there, I'm telling you, will kill your peace of mind. It will kill, trust me, it will kill your peace of mind. And what it does, it makes you lose trust in your own decision making. Because the believer, what me and you should do, you do istikhara, you do your homework, based on whatever information you have available. Brothers and sisters, hindsight is 2020 vision. Stop judging your old self based on what your new self knows. That person made a decision based on the information in front of them. I'll tell you one time, the Prophet said to him how to make a decision. The decision was, was, do we go out and fight or do we defend and fight? 
The Sahaba were like, we should go out, we should go out, we should go out. The Prophet's like, all right, we going out. He said those words, we're going out. He went in his house. While he was in his house, the Sahaba, they were like, oh, maybe we were, we were too harsh on him. When he comes out, let's tell him we changed our minds. The Prophet came out in his armor. I mean, like, that's beautiful right there. But anyways, he came out in his armor. And they're like, oh, we're sorry. We, we, we actually want to stay. He's like, mm-mm, we chose already. We didn't even win that, right, yo. You know that. We didn't win that. We didn't win that. But if you allow yourself to say, what if, you will, you will kill yourself with torment, I'm telling you. Drop it. It's shaitan's trick to remove your happiness away from you. Whenever it happens, you say, alhamdulillah, qadrullah, masha'ah. All right, how do we deal with the situation in front of us right now? Let's get busy. That's what we do. We don't sit there and fantasize over what could have happened. We deal with reality and face it. So uh, I told you this is a beautiful one. And I said it hurts your faith too because now you start doubting Allah's taqdeer, Allah's destiny, what he has written for you. Me and you in this room, everyone in this room believes that Allah ordains what is best for us. That's it. We may not like it. We may not know what's good for us. But Allah knows what's best for us. He ordains that for us. So um, you lose trust in your own decisions and you torment yourself with a reality that doesn't even exist. This is the danger of low. The words, uh, what if. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, it causes two problems. Number one problem, you become helpless. You, you can't do anything because you're not facing reality. You're staying inside this world of what if, what if, what if. And then the other problem brings me to another one. Ibn Qayyim al Jozi he says, by you saying what if, it leads you to a very, very deadly satanic aspect of us that Satan exploits, which is laziness. All right, this is a heavy one. These are the two topics we're going to talk about today. What if uh, and laziness. And I, there's one more, but we'll see if we get to it. Um, last week, I talked about the hustle culture we live in now. The hustle culture, you got to grind constantly. You got to grind, you got to work, you got you to gotta have like three IT jobs, none of them know about each other, right? You got you gotta like, to push it, right? You got to push it, right? You got to go hard, you got to go hard, you got to go hard, right? And um, I, 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 last week I said, like, that's not Islamic, yo. Like, in Islam, there's an aspect of reflection, relax, live your life, enjoy the blessings that you have of each day. So we talked about that. And so today when I talk about um, kasal or being lazy, um, I want us to understand on the other side, I'm not pushing this hustle culture where we're, we're these productivity masters and we never take a break to breathe. Quite the contrary, Islam is about stopping, reflecting, looking at what you have. But, but shaitan uses this, this, uh, this aspect of us. And when we become lazy, he literally strips humanity from us. And I'm going to break that down, what I mean. I was reading a Christian philosopher, and I thought it was just interesting, so I'm sharing this. This ain't Islamic, but I want, you to, I want to share this with you. They, this Christian philosopher, he said that it seems that the punishment for sloth or laziness in the akhirah would be a person that is made to constantly run at full speed. And it hit me deep. It's like you have potential to do so much. You have potential to do so much. But what happens is, see, here's the deal, y'all. Sometimes you got drive but no time. I'm trying to get a lot of stuff done, but I got three kids, man, and a wifey that all deserve my time. I got a lot of drive right now. But when I was 17, 18, all time, no drive. So my talk today is to the youngins, man. What's up? Someone see if she needs something. Yeah. Um, so my talk today is for everyone. Oh, move, move. I mean, there's. If y'all can move up a little bit. Then. Alhamdulillah. All right. So what I was trying to explain, Bismillah. I mean, that's all. That's it. Okay, this aspect of kasal, yo, this, this aspect of kasal, this meaning of laziness, in Arabic we call it kasal, to be lazy. And 
I want to share a hadith with you because I want you to see that it's a satanic thing that shaitan exploits from within us. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, I want you to listen closely to this. The Prophet Sallallahu said, يَعْقِدُ الشَّيْطَانَ عَلَىٰ قَافَةِ رَأْسِ أَحَدِكُمْ إِذَا هُوَ نَامَ ثَلَاثَ أَقَدْ He says that when a person goes to sleep at night, and this is a metaphysical reality the Prophet is teaching, this is a sound narration from Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Prophet Sallallahu said that shaitan ties three knots on the back of your neck when you go to sleep at night. What does that mean? We'll understand as this hadith goes forward. And each time he ties the knot, Shaitan says, may you have a long night's rest. May you have a long night's rest. May you have a long night's rest. And y'all might be thinking, good luck, Shaitan. But that ain't what he means, yo. A lot of us like, yo, I wish I could get a long night's rest. But what he means is he wants you to oversleep your religious obligation to Allah. He wants you to wake up. And, and, and y'all don't understand, man. I remember as a non-Muslim, it's hard to actually remember before Fajr, y'all. Like, I know we struggle with it. Let's be real. We struggle with it. That's why we have a, a, a group, a text message group. We'll be like, yo, where you at? Where you at? You know? But, like, to begin your day with the remembrance of Allah is such a beautiful thing. And so listen to this hadith. The Prophet says these words. If you wake up in the morning, write this down. This is heavy. Allah, And the first thing you do is you remember Allah. The first thing you wake up, you don't check no app, you don't check nothing. The first thing you do is you say, Alhamdulillah. The one, all praise to Allah who gave me life. I'm alive. If the moment you wake up, you remember Allah, one of those knots is opened up. And then the Prophet said, if then you make wudu, right? You make that cold wudu, cold water in the morning. Make wudu. Another knot is opened. And then if on top of that you pray, the last knot is opened up. So the idea here, I want us to all understand, the idea here is that you wake up and you're remembering Allah. You're glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, if you do this, hear me out, nashitan, you'll wake up with energy. You'll be, see, here's the deal. When we talk about lazy, there's three types of laziness, y'all. There's mental laziness, where all of us be, be zombie scrolling for hours. Mental laziness, where your brain doesn't feel like doing anything and you're just sitting there just scrolling, scrolling, 20 minutes went past. Here's what you have to understand. Emptiness hurts. Inactivity hurts. It doesn't feel good to be inactive. There, that's why the Arabs, they used to say, in if you want to not get tired, get tired, so that you don't get tired. You don't get it. You don't get it. You feel the best when you're grinding. That's why I started today with, I'm not, I don't love hustle culture. Because I was about to go hard on grinding. And I know y'all going to be like, oh my God, I got to be productive. I can't breathe. No. We have time for thought, reflection, all of that. But right now, what many of us young people struggle with is we don't have the energy or the will to do anything. We don't feel like doing anything. And I need you to understand that this is satanic. He wants you to be inactive because inactive is a lesser form of death. He can't take your life away, but he can take your action away and you might as well be dead. So his, his method is to take away all that motivation. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, you wake up, first thing you do is you remember Allah. You make that wudu and you pray if you can. You pray. What happens at that point? The Prophet Sallallahu says, you wake up with, with, with energy. And as I said, three types of, of, of uh, laziness. Mental laziness, physical, and spiritual laziness. Spiritual laziness. Like, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can run a mile today, but I can't sit down and do liquor for like five minutes, yo. I don't feel like it. Like, I could, but I just don't feel like it. All of these areas are the areas we're trying to fight shaitan in. Mental laziness, fight hard against this. Physical laziness, just get up. Get up. Whenever you feel that heaviness... Just get up. You got to get up. You got to move. You feel me? You got to get up. You got to move around. And the spiritual laziness, we're going to go through all the methods of removing it, but the spiritual laziness begins with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now listen. Wa illa, if you fail to wake up with the remembrance of God, asbaha khabithu nafs keslan, you wake up feeling bad and without any 
zeal or without, with, with laziness towards your spiritual regimen. So what I'm trying to show us here is that realize this. Doing nothing does not feel good. It makes you restless and more anxious. You ever, I was talking to my students about this today. You ever notice how you, when people go on a vacation to a beach, they take a book? Because you're going to get there and be bored. Like, all right, the water is nice. Now what do I do? You know what I mean? I need a spreadsheet to organize or something. You know what I mean? I'm going to like, yo, I need to design something real quick. You know what I mean? Like, subhanAllah. I, I, Cal Newport wrote a beautiful book, book called uh, Deep Work. And he said in that book, he showed a, they did a study where they kept a little pager. Y'all know what pagers are? Yo, can I tell y'all a funny story? So I'm going into my community. All right, I'm going to have to reveal something about myself. There's a gate in my front of my community. All right, you need a code. That don't mean I'm bougie. Don't judge me. I love my body. I, M- Makari came to my house. And he was like, moving on up, yo. <laughs> you need a code to get in. Wow. Man, it's in the hood with a code. What do you expect? <laughs> That's what we do. We move in the hood, but we get a nice community in the hood. Okay, hold up. So I pull up, and there's this uh, Amazon car there. I'll get back to this in a minute, but this is a funny story. There's an Amazon, and the guy can't get in the gate. So I yell to him the code. I say, you know, 5333 pound. He looks at me, and he goes, is pound a hashtag? I'm like different generation yo he said is pound the hashtag or the other joint I was like yo Habibi (laughs) yo I'm from a different generation man I was like hashtag man hashtag he's like alright good looks yo alright anyway sorry so the the point I was I was I was trying to make um uh to my to my students is that shaitan gives us this idea this thought that when we're doing nothing, we'll feel recharged. But Cal Newport, in his, in his book, Deep Work, they did a study where they gave everyone a pager, right? Y'all know what a pager is? Okay. All right, okay. Uh, they gave everyone a pager. I don't know. Uh, they gave everyone a pager, and they would periodically text, page them, and they would have to respond in a questionnaire how, how uh, uh, fulfilled they were feeling. And they f- found that when people were most engaged in something, that is the time they got the most fulfillment. Now, shaitan tells us the, act- the opposite. Relax, chill, do nothing, you'll feel great. But after a, a short time of doing nothing, we feel restless. And so the Arabs, they had this am- amazing statement. They would say, in If you don't want to get tired, then get tired so that you don't truly get tired. And the idea is this, the end al faragh he says, because when you're, Fadig, we use the word fadig, you're not occupied. He says that whatever isn't occupied loses its ability. An arm not used loses its ability. Ears not used lose their ability. That's why as we age, they tell us you got to keep using it or you lose it. So here's the deal. The reason why shaitan wants you to bring you to kesel or lazy because you don't do anything. And this is where shaitan, he can't take us away, but he could take away the potential of us to make change in people's lives and our own lives by bringing laziness on top of us. So um, he's trying to ruin that capacity. This is why scholars, they used to say this, hear me out. Fil haraka baraka. Fil haraka. Haraka in Arabic means movement. In movement, there's blessing. They used to say, if you look at Flowing water versus still water. Flowing water never goes bad. Movement, 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 movement. So when your watch tells you get up, take some steps, be like, alhamdulillah. Time to move a little bit. So the idea here is we, we really need to understand how are we going to fight against uh, uh, mental laziness, physical laziness, and spiritual laziness. Here's my recommendation. Number one. We need to all understand al mu'min yamutu bi irqi jabini. The mu'min, me and you, we die with sweat on our brow. We die with sweat on our brow. That's a hadith. That means we die working hard. We die grinding. We die try we die doing our best. When we leave the world, we weren't doing nothing. We were putting in our best effort. Tell yourself you can do it. A lot of us in this room don't realize our true potential. For too long you've been told you don't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't reach. Here's what I want you to understand. Once you taste the taste of success one time, there's nothing better than it. 
But you know what's equally as motivating? The feeling when you fail, yo. When you try your best in that marathon and you don't finish, it hurts so bad that it pushes you. So the pain of failure motivates you, but the joy of success motivates you. So tell yourself you can do it. Number two, set small goals. You wake up in the morning and make your bed, say, alhamdulillah, yo, Mikael, you doing things today. You doing things today. No victory is a small victory. It's all moving towards positivity. Here's the next one, number three. Please realize this. There's one of two pains. The pain of effort or the pain of regret, yo. Please hear me out on this. There's one of two pains we're all going to face. You're either going to try your best and you're going to feel the effort, the pain of that, or you're going to be surrounded with your own unrealized potentials, and that will hurt far more than the pain of struggling. Number four, when you feel lazy, get up, yo. Don't sit there and sulk. Don't keep scrolling. Throw the phone away. Get up. Go for a walk. Move around. Do something. Stay busy. Number six, this hadith tells us morning prayers and dhikr. Please understand the spiritual connection to the metaphysical aspects of who we are. Please understand that that dhikr and that morning are essential to you removing this effect of shaitan on you and, and, and holding you down with this laziness. And um, last but not least, my advice to all of us is to realize our potential. Realize the potential that you have. And I mentioned this before. Uh, shaitan has convinced you that you don't matter. Your efforts won't make an impact. What we need to remind each other is uh, that you do matter and you can make a profound impact. There's a great poet. His name is Amir Suleiman, great lyricist, Muslim. And if this doesn't motivate you, it motivated me. He said this, you are somebody's ancestors, so act like it. When you have a son that looks at you and says, Baba, is there anyone stronger than you? That's what Qasim said to me, yo. He didn't see us yo. <laughs> he said, Baba, is there anyone stronger than you? When, at that moment, when those young eyes look at you, as a mother, as an older sister, as a father, as an older brother, you're somebody's ancestors, so act like it. Do you know what that means? That means, like, yo, they're going to be looking back like, yo, granddad hate them. Yo, he set the precedent, yo. Granddad Makare, you know what he did? Grandma Manar, you know what she did? Like, what it, the people will look back at what you did. I don't know if that motivates you, but that hit me deep. You're somebody's ancestors, so act like it. Get out of this lazy, this, this moment of laziness. Invigorate yourself. Realize what you can do in life. Strive for that and realize that you're doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there's one more reason why we may be feeling lazy. It may be because none of this matters to you yet. You don't realize why am I doing any of this and you haven't loved Allah enough yet then. You haven't known Allah enough. You haven't loved Allah enough to realize what I'm striving for. Hey y'all, I'm striving for Jannah, yo. That's it. What are we grinding for? What gets me out of bed? What pushes me to keep trying when I feel like quitting? I'm striving for that pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That right there is your motivation, y'all. So today, what did we talk about? Stop living in virtual reality. The word if doesn't exist. Now, I want to say one more thing. Stop applying if to the people around you in your life that you love. Stop saying to your dad, what if you had did this? Stop saying to your husband, but if you hadn't did this, Y'all wasn't ready for that yet. Because up till now, we were only dealing with our own ifs. But what about the ifs you keep saying for the one next to you? And I'm going to speak to parents here. Stop saying to your kids, what if? Help them live in the reality they're in right now. Sometimes we in arguments with people, the whole argument is based on a fictional me. <laughs> like, yo, your parent is legit arguing with you because you're not that 
fictional doctor you were supposed to be. But that ain't real. <laughs> That's not me. In your mind, you made up this fictional multiverse me that I didn't become. Stop. Stop. Deal with this moment. A lot of us are living with shoulds and ifs because other people impress those upon us. Yeah, when you internalize yourself, you can strive to reach your best self. But here's the deal. There's an auntie that spoke to me last week about this. Look, before something happens, believers are taught we strive our best. That's what this hadith says. Mu'min qawi. Try. You want good. You strive. You ask Allah for help. But the moment it happens, right there you have a flick of switch, y'all. What, what's, what what's, uh, switch do you flick? Qadr Allah, masha'ah. Somebody may say, well, y'all Muslims mad lazy then. Uh-uh, you missed the first part. We try as if there is no taqdeer. But the moment it's over, we just leave it to Allah. So never ever say that. Oh, you're just using taqdeer. Yeah, if you didn't try, that's like the person who came up to the prophet. He argued, he lost, and he said, hasbun Allah. The prophet's like, uh-uh, come back. Try your best first, then say hasbun Allah. So... Today's lesson was number one, don't place other people in alternative realities, if scenarios, and make that reality. That's not reality. Deal with what's on the table right now, the reality before us all. Number two, for yourself. You try your best. Something goes wrong. Never ever say, if I had did this, this would have happened. No, you don't know if that would have happened. Nor do you know if that would have been good for you. Asa'an tuhibu shay'an wa huwa sharrul lakum. Number two. The effect of this law, the prophet says it opens the door of shaitan. How does it open the door? Two things. Inability, because you're not working towards the moment. And number three, number two, laziness. These are the two things it brings in. Both of those are from shaitan. Laziness. How do we have to fight laziness? We have to first start off with the remembrance of Allah. Start off with the remembrance of Allah. When you go to sleep at night, go to sleep with the remembrance of Allah. When you wake up, please do this. First thing in the morning, you wake up, you say, all praise to Allah, alhamdulillah. My eyes, I open my eyes. Make wudu, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and move on with your day from there. Remember who you are, set your goals, move and realize that the believer dies with sweat on their brow. Laziness, inability, living in alternate reality. These are what shaitan wants us to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to make decisions, live in the reality invigorate our lives with high aspirations and, uh, and strive for those aspirations. My last advice is the advice of the poet, Amir Suleiman, which is, uh, you're someone's ancestor, so act like it. May Allah uh, allow us to reach our full potentials and protect us from the whispers of shaitan, inshallah. Uh, shout out to the suhba community who uh, uh, gave us all tea before our halakha. Alhamdulillah, suhba on the other side of the campus was open for tea at 6.30 for, for tea and other things, inshallah. So jazakumullah khair to Ustad and everyone who facilitated that, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us insight into how shaitan tries to throw us off the track. May Allah allow us to be motivated, invigorated. May Allah allow us to live in the present moment and always realize that whatever Allah has written, it is the best thing for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to stay away from living in this alternate reality of what if I did this, what if I had done that. May Allah allow us to wake up every morning invigorated and motivated to live our best self for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumallahu khairah.